Welcome to Eurodollar University with Jeff Snyder. My name is Emil Kalinowski. We're recording on the 16th of June, 2022. And on the 15th of June, Jerome Powell, head of the Federal Reserve, went in front of everybody and announced a 75 basis point increase. We just went over his press conference introductory statement. Jeff reacted live to it. Afterwards, the press, the financial media, the pinnacle of our investigative financial journalism addressed and asked questions of this very unusual rate hike. And what kind of questions does the press ask? Not, well, they didn't acquit themselves well, Jeff, in my opinion. But what we're going to do is you're going to be the chairman. A lot of people on Twitter say we should have Jeff be the chairman. Jeff, you're going to answer. You are now the Federal Reserve chairman. These questions are addressed to you, but answer them not as a politician, not as the traditional Federal Reserve chairman, but someone who understands the role of the Fed within this nebulous system of offshore money creation of all the other markets and what they're indicating. Answer them as you would if you're in charge, okay? Do I get a say in this? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> uh, you, can we just, uh, you know, if, if I was actually a chairman of the Fed, and I get asked that all the time, I would, the first thing I would do is shut all this stuff down because it's just a waste of time. It's just, it's just, it's just, uh, it, it perpetuates the wrong narrative. It perpetuates the wrong kind of ideas about what, what goes on. But you understand why in an expectations-based system that, re, that is built upon managing and even manipulating people's expectations, you go through what are essentially just rituals. And that's what this press conference is. It's a ritual. That's what these statements are. It's to reinforce the idea that these are very smart, powerful people and they're in charge and they get bombarded with questions from the best of the financial press. And so let's just, let's just leave everything in their hands and not think about things for ourselves. So if I'm Fed chairman, the first thing I'm doing is getting rid of all this stuff and going back to saying, let's be proficient in what we're supposed to be proficient in. And if we are, we don't need a damn press conference. We just work. As you know, who was it? Montague Norman from the Bank of England said, you know, never explain, never apologize, just do it. Because if you do it well, everything happens the way it's supposed to. Very well. At the end of this press conference, you can announce that this will be the last press conference that we are <laughs> okay. going to be holding. And of course, Jeff, you've been in charge at the Fed for a while now. So you don't have to do the narrative supply. You can actually talk about what the Fed is capable of doing and what it isn't capable of doing. And feel free to channel your favorite National Football League coach, Bill Belichick, where he gets asked a question and he doesn't want to answer it. And he can say, I've already answered that question or we're moving on to the next game or, or something along those lines. So feel free to just ignore and dismiss these questions. Okay. Howard Schneider from Reuters, his question, two related questions, questions, Chair Powell, do you feel you boxed yourself in with the language you used at the last press conference on a 50 basis point hike in June and July? And would you please give us as detailed a sense as you can over what role you played in reshaping market expectations so quickly on Monday? Well, do, do I feel... Do as Jerome Powell, do I feel that the Fed was boxed in by its language? But you're not yes, Jerome Powell, obviously. Jeff. A answer as yeah, Jeff well, that's would. The thing. I charge. would answer that question very differently. I would say no, I'm not boxed in yes. because I'm 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 answering questions with legitimate uh, with legitimate knowledge that's rather than just this, this psycho psychological hokum. So the truth is, Mr. Reuters reporter, yes, that the Fed did a 75 basis point a rate hike because the headlines were really bad. <laughs> And we're getting all sorts of political pressure. And we had to do something that made the public realize we're on top of it. Even though we're not really on top of it, we got to get everybody talking about how we're on top of it. And the only way to do that is by surprising everybody by going farther. Even though I said we wouldn't, I have to shock. I have to surprise. So if I said last time we didn't and this time we do, it's because, hey, we got some bad press and we need to do something about it. I Politics 101. I love it, Jeff. That's that's the answer we're looking for. Truth, not managing expectations or managing narrative. You're coming out, you're changing the direction of the Fed. This is your last press conference. You've got the full support of the president, whoever he or she is. So don't President worry. President Phillips. 
<laughs> Gianna Smialek from the New York Times. I guess I wonder if you could describe for us a little bit how you're deciding how aggressive you need to be. So obviously 75 today, what did 75 achieve that 50 wouldn't have? And why not go for a full percentage point at some point? As this astute commentator Emil Kalinowski <laughs> said in a podcast segment previously, what it achieved was that it got the actual mainstream press, not just the financial press, it got the mainstream press talking about how aggressive the Federal Reserve was being in fighting this massive inflationary disaster that's befalling the people. So that was my intent. The intent was to get the all the press, get everybody talking about this really effective rate hiking stuff, so aggressive, the, the biggest you've seen in 28 years, and get in, uh, as long as people are talking about it, we're going to assume that creates a positive psychological benefit in various ways, which I don't want to go over here because if I get if I get into the psychology behind it, you'll you'll think I'm crazy and that we're a bunch of just uh, snake oil salesmen. <laughs> Love it. Steve Leisman, CNBC. <laughs> Thank you for taking my question, Mr. Chairman. And he asked this question and he had to follow up. I guess this, he wasn't quite happy with uh, what Powell answered. So I'll, I'll read that follow up as well, just so you understand what he's trying to drive at here. You have not used the phrase in a long time, quote, monetary policy is in a good place, quote which is a phrase that you used to use often. Now that the committee is projecting 4% on a, or 3.8% next year in terms of the funds rate, which is similar to where the market is now, the futures market, a 4% funds rate next year. Do you think that's a level that is going to be sufficiently high enough to deal with and bring down the inflation problem? And just as a follow-up, could you break that apart for me? How much of that is restrictive and how much of that is a normal positive rate that ought to be embedded or not, in your opinion, in the funds rate? Thank you. And then another follow-up. Follow up. Well, hang on. Let's, let me answer some of these questions first. I, I don't even Starting understand. With, is the Fed funds rate high enough? Well, no, I don't care how high the Fed funds rate goes. That's not how this works. We, we, you, we've got you all thinking that we have a bunch of models where we specify a neutral rate, a tight rate, a, a loose rate, but that's not really what goes on here. We just slap this shit together and just say, well, the headlines are bad. We need to do something about it. So we're free to just say, hey, 75 basis points this time. It could be 125 next time. It could be 30. It could be 20. It could be 36.7 if that's what we need it to be, because all of this is about creating buzz. All of it's about getting people talking. There's no scientific formulas. There's no money here. So when I say monetary policy is in a good place, what I'm actually telling you is that things don't appear to be falling apart. And so we're going to take credit for the fact that it's not incredibly awful. So when you hear me say monetary policy is in a good place, that just means it's not obviously awful today. So like now, we're consumer prices are accelerating extremely high. What I'm telling you is that monetary, I'm not saying monetary policy is in a good place because everybody knows that's crap. They could tell it's not in a good place. So I'm going to use the federal funds rate specifically to get people talking. And I'm going to use whatever rate and whatever level and whatever change I need to in order to accomplish that goal because there is no money in monetary policy. I can't tell you if this is inflation because I wouldn't have the first damn clue if it was. Leisman's follow up, but does 3.8, 4% get it done? Does it get the job done of breaking the back of inflation? Chairman. Like my predecessor, Paul Volcker, I have no damn idea. Okay. Nick T. Biaros of the Wall Street Journal. Chair Powell, you've said that you like your policy to work through expectations. And now, obviously, <laughs> what, what, what gave you that idea? <laughs> okay. And now, obviously, this... you're not supposed to say that out loud, Mr. Reporter. <laughs> and now, obviously, this decision was something quite different from how you and almost all of your colleagues had set those expectations during the intervening period. And I know you just said that what changed was really the inflation data, the inflation expectations data. But I'm wondering, on the inflation expectations data, was there something you saw that was unsettling enough to risk eroding the credibility 
of your verbal guidance by doing something so different from what you have social vocalized before. So if you saw movement like that again, another tick up in inflation expectations, would that put a 75 or even a 100 basis point increase in play at your next meeting? It all depends upon the press. It all depends upon the headlines surrounding the next inflation number, whether or not it's good or bad or somewhat. How do we gauge how the public is actually reacting? Uh, people are already angry. Are they becoming angrier? Because that's really the setting here as these rate hikes are nothing more than political theater. Therefore, everything we're doing is based upon whether or not we can make people believe that we're, we're, we're acting in some way on their behalf and getting the, uh, trying to accomplish the goal of bringing consumer prices back down again, or at least the, getting the rate of increase back down again, when we have no idea how to do that. We can't get oil out of the ground. We can't get containers to China. We can't get semiconductors into trucks and cars. But we need to get people to believe that we can. So we have to construct this narrative. And part of the narrative is reacting to data. And if the data is worse, better, or some in some ways different than we expected, then we have to recalibrate what we're doing based on the data and the, the how we believe the, the people are reacting to the data, not actually quantifying the amount of money or the number of interest rate hikes or the amount of interest rates or a level of interest rates that are required to get inflation back under control. Because again, as I said before, we have no idea how this actually works. We're just trying to play upon people's emotions in order to accomplish what we hope is a political task of getting this stuff off the front pages. Hi, Chair Powell, Neil Irwin from Axios. Thanks for taking our questions. The late breaking kind of decision to go for seven to 75 basis points, do you worry that that will make policy guidance a less effective tool in the future? And should we think of that as a kind of symmetrical reaction function if we start to get soft readings on inflation or if the labor market starts to roll over. Oh, now you're talking about markets and we don't do that around here. We don't we, we do not bring up markets and in inverted curves because we believe or we have to believe that those those are basically nothing. So, you know, whether or not the the hiking federal funds rate, that's really again, as I said before, this is all about uh, ma manufacturing headlines, manufacturing press. It's not really about inflation, it's not really about consumer prices, it's not really about symmetry or all Forward guidance, I mean, does anybody actually take that seriously? We don't even take it seriously around here because it's, again, it's just more snake oil, more, more hokum. It's, it, we, we slap really complicated words like Delphic forward guidance and Odyssean forward guidance just to confuse the public so they don't ask any questions about what really is um, make-believe, pretend, fairy tale. So will this make forward guidance more or less effective? Well, since it's not effective at all, no. Thank you for <laughs> thank you so much for taking our questions. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. On the clear and convincing threshold for the inflation trajectory, what is the level of realized inflation that meets that criteria? And how is the committee thinking about the potential trade-off of much higher unemployment than even than even what's forecasted in the SEP? If inflation is not moderating, you know, at this acceptable pace, then Mr. Powell says, sorry, I, the second part, I didn't get it. I didn't either. You know what the potential trade-off with higher unemployment than even what's forecasted in the SEP if inflation is not moderating at an acceptable pace. I don't know what he's, what is the SEP, Jeff? What he's talking about is the Phillips curve. Okay, what right. he's saying is you expect, you're using the Phillips curve, at least that's what he's alleging. You're using the Phillips curve to say if we, if we stomp the brakes on the economy, we stomp the brakes on the uh, labor market, that will bring inflation down. And so what he's implying by that question is that there's some formulaic anticipation between doing those two things, if X, then Y. When, as the Federal Reserve would say, well, the Phillips curve is another one of those things we trot out that isn't actually valid in the real world. We're just using it to try to, to bolster our credibility amongst this expectation psychological crap that we use. Therefore, in reality, we don't expect anything out of the Phillips curve because there is no real Phillips curve. And certainly we're not at a point where we, we believe there would be because, you know, the unemployment rate may, may be low. But as Janet Yellen said correctly many years ago, hidden slack, we have no idea what the relationship between the unemployment rate and actual consumer prices may be because history has shown that it's not really that tight to begin with. So 
it's not like we're going to say if the unemployment rise, rises this much, we expect inflation to come down this much because we have no clue. We're just winging this. We're just trying to manipulate psychological behavior among the public so that they stop being angry at their politicians and voting them out of office in November. That's really kind of the only thing here. It's not like a quantitative easing. Well, actually, it is like quantitative easing because that's not really quantitative either. We're just picking numbers out of a hat. We're just we're just throwing darts at the chalkboard. We're using the magic eight ball. We're doing all of these ritualistic be, uh, types of, of behaviors just to just to manufacture a narrative. There's a book on my shelf called Scale, and it's by Jeffrey West. Universal Laws of Growth, Innovation, Sustainability, and the Pace of Life in Organisms, Cities, Economies, and Companies. And it's about systems, systems thinking, Jeff. I haven't read it yet. I can't wait. It comes highly recommended. But I would be stunned if Jeffrey writes in there that when it comes to systems, there's a formulaic approach. If X, then Y. No chance. There's no chance. Yet the Fed approaches this whole system, this monetary order, the economy, with X, if X, then Y solutions. It's bananas. Next question. Or at least that's what they want you to believe. But that's not, that, again, that's part of the carefully constructed facade mm. with the first brick of that facade being placed uh, in, under, in, under Paul Volcker is the idea that we know what we're doing. If X, then Y. That's what quantitative easing was all about. The name itself was meant to convey this technical proficiency that they do not possess. And again, you don't have to take our word for it. We're just, you know, as we did with our Volcker series, and that's not done. We got another part to go there. You can use their own words. They have no idea how this system works. They actually say that in private. We have no idea how this works. But in order to craft that facade, in order to present this careful image of a technocracy, it, they have to make it sound like if X, then Y, when it's nothing for and. You know, they let the mask slip all, all, all the time. As you said in the last episode, during Jay Powell's prepared remarks, you kind of said we kind of threw this 75 basis point rate hike together at the last minute haphazardly. That's not if X, then Y. Mm. That's, oh, my God, the last CPI was more than expected. The headlines are really bad. That's all this is. This is not, this is not scientific. It's not formulaic. It's about, you know, something else entirely. The audience may be wondering, how you're privy to private conversations because you said in their private conversations they admit they don't know what they're doing you're referring to the FOMC transcripts there there they don't say it we don't know what we're doing but pretty close they're saying well we don't know what this is or what it has anything to do with so that's where they're and coming from you know what the from. funny part about that Emil yes. is is that up until Alan Greenspan in the 1990s these were not privy we were public was not privy to these mm -hmm. discussions in fact, there's a famous episode, uh, Alan Greenspan in front of Congress testifying, uh, I think, I can't remember who it was, asked him, do these transcripts exist? And this, I think, was where FedSpeak was actually born, the idea that you say a lot without saying anything, where he answered this guy's question without ever answering the question about whether or not they actually had transcripts of these FOMC meetings, because they didn't want people to know what they were actually saying in private for very good reason. And it was only in this later 1990s, 2000s transition to this more expectation, expectations policy that they, they went toward this, the, uh, they trended toward transparency. The idea that we wanted to project the scientific image and the way we do that is by making everything open and uh, open, and at least appear to be open and honest so that it wouldn't generate conspiracy theories that we could prove ourselves to the public, all sorts of other things. But, you know, these were not public discussions, or they were not. They were never meant to be available to the public, at least not until more recently. Rachel Seigel from the Washington Post. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you for taking our questions. So the new projections show the unemployment rate ticking up through 2024. Is a higher unemployment rate necessary in order to combat inflation? And what is lost if the unemployment rate has to go up and people lose their jobs? in order to control inflation. Does that include people losing their jobs? Well, the Phillips curve says it is, and we're pretending that we care about the Phillips curve, we're pretending that we're using the Phillips curve, so it has to be one or the other. And since my bosses in, in the White House and in Congress are angry at me about this CPI, I have to tell you that I'm trading the unemployment rate for the CPI. 
Hi, Chair Powell. Matthew Bosler with Bloomberg. So as you just mentioned, the committee is now projecting a half percentage point rise in the unemployment rate and the SEP over the next couple of years, and it removed a line from its policy statement about thinking that the labor market can remain strong while it tightens policy. You just mentioned that that is still your objective, though. So I'm wondering if you could explain why that line was removed from the statement and also whether this means that the FOMC is trying to induce a recession now to bring inflation down. No, we don't. We're not trying to reduce and induce into a recession because we wouldn't know how to to begin with. <laughs> what we're really trying to do is make you think that we're trading one thing for the other when markets have a completely different idea. That's where the recession talk is coming from because the recession risk is actually real. And we're going to pretend that it's not because that would harm our ability to fool the public into believing that we can deal with inflation in the most pain free way possible. So if you believe, and if I want to get you to believe that we can deal with consumer prices in the most pain-free po pain way possible, I have to also get you to believe that this recession risk is minimal, that it's small, that I don't see a downturn, that we're not, we're, we're not trying to provoke a recession, which we can't. Um, it's really just trying to tell you that this is, we're going to thread this needle. We're going to produce the most optimal outcome possible, which is a modest, small slowdown in the economy that's going to be traded for a, a, a very large downshift in consumer prices over the future. That's what we're going to continue to tell you. And we're going to continue to hike rates until it becomes so obvious as the markets are pricing that the economy is way worse than we actually tell you it is. And then we're going to have to stop and reassess and just wing something else against the wall and hope something else sticks. Usually in the form of rate cuts, which is what the euro dollar futures and yield curves are saying. But we'll get to that down the road. But for now, we're going to bring inflation down by just cutting a little bit off of the economic growth, a little bit off the labor market. And it's really not about people losing jobs. At least we're going to pretend it's not about people losing jobs. We're just going to tell you it's about a few people who didn't get hired that maybe would have otherwise. Thanks, Chair Powell. Edward Lawrence with Fox Business. I want to ask you, you talked about CPI going to 8.6%. The retail sales surprised the market by falling and then revisions to the previous months were down. Are you hearing from contacts about consumers slowing spending or changing their habits? Obviously, I'm hearing that, but I'm not going to tell you. It, perfect. Jeff, let me actually read what he said, because this is the, well, this is something that will go down in infamy. This is what Powell actually said. Quote, well, there's no sign of a broader slowdown that I can see in the, in the economy. People are talking about it a lot. Consumer confidence is very low. That's probably related to gas prices and also just stock prices to some extent for other people. But that's what we're <laughs> seeing. Those are happening in a vacuum. <laughs> we're not seeing a broad slowdown. We see job growth slowing, but it's still at quite robust levels. We see the economy slowing a bit but still growth levels, healthy growth levels. Just like Famous Paul Volcker. Last words. Remember we talked about that in the Volcker episode, the, the SEP, SEP projections, the staff economic projections in the, the late 1970s into the early 1980s, and then again, 80, 81, where they forecast the Goldilocks scenario where the Fed would do what it's going to do and then the economy would slow down, but it would avoid recession and then it would accelerate off into the sunset, the Hollywood sun, sunset future. And that's what the Fed always projects. Every single in 2000, for example, the dot com bus, Alan Greenspan, private conversations, FOMC meetings. We're not forecasting much more than a slowdown. We're still more worried about inflation. Never mind the dot com bust. That's just stock prices. No big deal. We're not forecasting a recession in 2001, just a modest slowdown. Pay no attention to the inverted yield curve. Pay no attention to those pesky euro dollar futures, which are betting against lower rates rather than higher. Never mind. We just forecast a slowdown. 2006, 2007, same SEP, same discussion. We don't forecast us anything more than a slowdown. They were saying that into 2008. They were in the middle of 2008, still wondering if the U.S. was going to avoid a recession entirely, just like that Paul Volcker had done in 1979 and 1981, just like Jay Powell is doing today. 
Markets are telling you one thing. Powell and his econometrics are telling you another thing. And the reason they're, they're telling you two different things is because the, the Fed's econometrics don't have any input from the market. Mike McKee from Bloomberg Radio and Television. Are you targeting headline inflation now or core inflation? In other words, how far would you chase oil prices if they keep going up? If that's going to be the component that drives expectations, would you risk recession for a headline rate if the core rate is holding steady or starting to slow down? We're targeting headlines about inflation, not headline inflation. We only care about the headlines written about the number, not what the actual number is. Could I just follow up Mike Bloomberg, Mike McKee again from Bloomberg Radio. Can I get a clarification on the SEP, Staff Economic Projections? When the members gave their forecasts, I want to know when. When were they inserted into the record? Were they revised after the CPI or Michigan numbers came out? In other words, does the SEP as we have it now reflect the same factors that led you to go to a 75 point increase? Honestly, I don't know what the uh, actual mechanism is for that. I assume that these are updated. Nowadays, they're updated in real time. They used to have a more rigid schedule, but with you know modern technology, it's not that difficult to plug in a new CPI number when it comes out into the model and just see how it works. Even if you have to run a bunch of simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, at the end of the day, these things can be updated instantaneously. And I have to believe, given what was the headlines that the, the Fed has been experiencing, the economy politicians up to that point, they were going to update these models when the CPI came out, regardless. Whether they usually do that or not, that was going to be such an important point that they updated their models as soon as the new data was in, and they made their decision based on that. Uh, spoiler alert to the audience, these questions by the financial press are not fantastic in my mind. No one asks about the yield curve. No one asks about the bond market, euro dollar futures. At no point. Yes. You know what word? Yes, sir. Emil, you know what word we haven't used yet? Hmm. Collateral. Money. Money. None. That word has not come up once. Here we are talking about inflation, and nobody has said, "Hey, you know, is there too much money in the system? Is that what's hmm. going on?" No, this is all about you know the CPI, the unemployment rate, the Phillips curve. Expect. I mean, the guy even said <laughs> expectations. Let's not forget Ben Bernanke a couple of weeks ago. Monetary policy is 98% talk. That uh, she's wrong. It's 100% talk. That should be a question. But where's the money? This is really, is there too much money in the system or is there not? And you're right, because the, the excluding comments about the yield curve or any of these other markets are really about the monetary system telling us what's going on, what's going on money-wise. And they're not saying there's too much money. They're saying quite the opposite. And they have been for a long time already. But it's it's striking when you have this this type of setup for this thing and nobody's talking about the one thing that you should be talking all about. That it is striking, Jeff. That's what I want the audience to come away with is first, most importantly, your your responses to these questions. But secondly, the level of questions coming from the financial press and questions that an audience member who has has seen five episodes of our show would ask that never even come up. That being said, this, in my opinion, is the best question that is asked of the chairman. So take that with what you will. Here it comes. It comes from Victoria Gita from Politico. I wanted to ask about how you're measuring progress, especially since you've now started front-loading rate hikes more. You know, you've talked about how you want to see inflation coming down over a series of reports. And I guess I'm curious whether you think inflation data itself is a really good indicator or whether, you know, you might be concerned that it's a lagging indicator or that it might send confusing signals, given that, as you've talked about, there are sort of supply and demand aspects. And I guess my question is, you know, do you think that inflation will tell you, inflation data will tell you when you've gone to where you need to go? Or do you feel just feel like maybe it's better to overshoot than to undershoot? Yeah, I think that question really does get to the, the, the heart of the matter because mm -hmm. she's basically saying, she's basically asking Chairman Powell to to uh, weigh in on the on the idea, hmm. sort of the message that's that's underlined or that's underlying this entire press conference, which is, are you guys really just winging it? 
Are you really just kind of throwing shit at the wall and hoping something sticks? Because that's kind of how it sounds here. I know you present this facade about scientific, quantitative, formulaic. We've got all these models. We've got all this, all these numbers and there's all this math. But it really kind of feels like you're just groping along in the dark. Because as we know, that's exactly what's happening. happening. And at times, you know, even somebody like Chairman Powell or Ben Bernanke, who was absolutely great at this, has to can't keep up that parade all the time because it is so incoherent because it is so inconsistent you have to at times uh, let it slip that you know some of the stuff is just contradictory some of the stuff doesn't make sense if you actually think about it and it's really just designed to get people to not think about it it's really just designed this these rituals are just to get people to go back to sleep and think the fed's got it covered i don't know how but i'm that's beyond my pay grade those guys are really smart. They're the best and the brightest. They know what they're doing. So I don't need to ask questions. Jay Powell's doing it. And look, he just did a 75 basis point rate hike. Obviously, he's on top of things because, man, that's that's the biggest in 30 years. And that sounds really like an, it sounds like an incredibly important, momentous type of policy decision. So I don't really know how it works. I don't really know. I guess I'm not really supposed to know how it works. I'm not going to ask any questions. I think that's that's what the reporter's question was. It was kind of getting behind the facade, which is, you know, we kind of just give you the benefit of the doubt. Should we? The, and I think Jay Powell's answer, of course, would be yes. My answer as Jay Powell would be, of course not. What what in our re recent history tells you that you should give the Fed the benefit of the hmm. doubt about anything? Um, and again, as I've pointed out throughout lots of times, this, mod this invention of the Federal Reserve as some kind of technocratic ideal is a modern one. You go back to the 1980s, and especially the 1970s and before, the Fed was a joke. The Fed was treated as a redheaded stepchild for a reason, because it performed poorly in every type of occasion. They went from the Great, the Great Depression to an interim period where it was kind of messy to the Great Inflation. So throughout its early period, it was one huge mistake into the opposite huge mistake. And that really didn't change in the 1990s and 2000s, but the, they took credit for it anyway. So the, mod, the idea of a modern, all-powerful, omniscient central bank is a modern invention. It's, it's, it's something that was invented using the Paul Volcker myth as its origin story. Six more questions. Jeff, feel free to do the Bill Belichick. You're moving on to the next meeting, the next game. But I'm not answering that question. Brian Chung, Yahoo Finance. I just want to expand, I guess, on what you just said now about the general public feeling like, you know, you can get this done. When you talk about consumer sentiment being down, household inflation expectations being up, recession, recession just broadly being dinner table talk, does the general feeling among American households and also businesses square with your explanation of the economy, given that the description of inflation in the statement didn't change between May and June? No, of course it doesn't square because it's completely at odds with, them, with one another, and I'm not going to explain to you why. Uh, thank you, Chris Rugabear at Associated Press. You have talked about inflation a few times and mentioned oil prices, China lockdowns, but aside from rises in commodity prices, such as gas prices, we're also seeing stickier measurements of inflation increasing, such as the Cleveland Fed's median and trimmed mean CPIs. I mean, how persistent do you see those underlying measures of inflation, and how do you expect, where do you see those going in the near future? We see them continue to fall because their statistical constructions tied to the lagging indicator that is the CPI. So. Those are all backward looking stuff, which doesn't help us. Hi, Chair Powell. Nancy Marshall again, sir, with Marketplace. Do you still think a softish landing is possible? And how would you define that at this point, considering the revised projections for unemployment, GDP, and inflation? I'm going to pretend a soft landing is possible, or is, po is not only possible, but probable until it becomes so obvious I can't say that anymore. <laughs> oh. In what alternate universe could we have this press conference? Let's be delightful. Greg Robb from Market Watch, Chair Powell, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. You know, economists are worried that you're kind of hitting the economy with a sledgehammer and that now there's even more risk of a recession than a 50-50 path of rates. So 
Could you talk a little bit more about that? And what evidence would get you to stop rate hikes and maybe even reverse them? Reverse them, I bet. <laughs> Hmm. Well, we're absolutely going to have to reverse. I mean, the markets are absolutely correct. That's that's what's going to happen. But you're incorrect in that question and assuming that we're hitting the economy with anything, let alone a sledgehammer. We're mm -hmm. just raising rates and hoping people react in a way that is that is beneficial to what we're trying to accomplish, not knowing a single bit about how that actually might come about. And in fact, going against all recent history, which shows we have no idea what the hell we're doing. And none of these things have any predictable outcomes anyway. So we're not hitting the economy with anything. And if there's the recession that's being priced into markets, that's something else entirely. You can't blame us for that. We are, after all, in, in uh, using Paul Volcker's real legacy here. Penultimate question. Evan Reiser, Market News International. Thank you, Chair Powell. I was wondering if the Fed has initiated a review of the, of the conduct of monetary policy over the last two years or so, given the inflation. And will that be shared with the public? Oh, that's delightful. Have you guys looked You're yourself in the a mirror? Language here. <laughs> yes. And well, then, first of all, yeah, go on. <laughs> I was going to say that that's we don't allow monetary questions here because nothing we do here has anything to do with money, and so we're not going to review monetary policy because why would we? We don't do money anyway. All right, fair enough. Secondly, given the illiquidity and the extraordinary volatility in financial markets, are you concerned that QT will make that worse? To which Powell responded, "Sorry, what was your question on QT?" <laughs> Just given the illiquidity and extraordinary volatility in financial markets, whether QT will make things worse. It's not QT that has any relationship to anything. Remember when we did QT in 2017 and 2018, what happened to mar stock markets then? They went roaring higher mm -hmm. because back then the market, stock markets and stock investors were a little bit more confident in the actual economy, globally synchronized growth as much of a lie that that was. But, you know, Today, it's not QT, it's not the level of bank reserves. There's no correlation between bank reserves and any financial or economic outcome whatsoever. We're just doing QT so that we can say we have a bunch of tools to accomplish the goals that we set forward in the public. Final question, Mr. Chairman. Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. Wonder what your assessment is about the outlook for the housing market, given the years long increase in home prices and now the sharp rise in mortgage rates and all that, of course. Given the heightened sensitivity around the housing market, given the fact that it was the trigger for the great financial crisis over a decade ago. Thank you. It was not the trigger for the great financial crisis, but people think it was because we've led them to believe that it is. And I don't really feel a whole lot of sympathy. I'm speaking as a hypothetical Fed chairman, not as myself. I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for people in the real estate market over the last couple of years because they allowed themselves to be fooled into believing they need to buy real estate to protect themselves from a crashing dollar as a store of value like cryptocurrencies and other things. And the fact that a, a few basis or a few percentage points of interest rate hikes is enough to crack the housing market and bring about a real serious crash, a real serious downturn in housing shows you how hollow and how, how, uh, how inappropriate that uh, rise in housing had begun had been to begin with. So the housing market to me is nothing more than another example of the artificiality, the snake oil that's been sold across the financial media and across the mainstream as something that it isn't actually happening. We never actually had a robust recovery at all, but because everybody became fixated on consumer prices, because everybody was led to believe consumer prices accelerating were equivalent to a red hot economy, we've had this price illusion for well over a year that the economy's in really good, if not great shape, when in fact it never really was at any point along the way. And that concludes our press conference, Chairman. Thank you very much. You can take the rest of the month and a half off, do whatever you do during the intra-meeting period. And, and that's it. Thank you. All right. It was my pleasure. I can't